Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Stacey Varghese, and I'm the Associate Director in the Office of Advancement at St. John's University. Today, we kick off our special edition series on small business. John Sobriano and Michael Gibney are our panelists this evening, and they will discuss 10 strategic tips to make your business successful. Some housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have a question, please submit it on the bottom right in the Q&A section to panelists and hosts, and they will be answered throughout the fireside. As a reminder, please make sure to keep yourself on mute. Lastly, a recording of today's session will be emailed to you after the presentation. Now, I am excited to introduce our speakers. John Cipriano is a principal and wealth manager at Modera Wealth Management, LLC. As a wealth manager, he has had the privilege to provide advice to high net worth individuals, families, businesses, nonprofit organizations, and fiduciary clients in all areas of their investment and wealth management need. John has over 25 years of experience in financial planning, taxation, business consulting, financial counseling for business owners, and serving high net worth individuals. Michael Gibney is a principal and wealth manager at Madera Wealth Management, LLC. His main responsibilities include helping clients develop their financial plans, implementing wealth management strategies, and managing clients' investment portfolios. In his role, he serves small business owners and individuals throughout the United States. Michael has extensive experience working in all areas of financial planning, including retirement planning, estate planning, tax planning, and risk management. He specializes in retirement accumulation and distribution strategies and investment advisory services for foundations, trusts, and charitable organizations. He has over 20 years of experience in financial planning preceded by another 15 years of experience on Wall Street. Welcome, John and Michael. I will hand the webinar controls over to you now. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to continue to be involved in assisting with educational presentations for my alma mater. And tonight, uh, we're going to be having our first of a four part uh, special edition webinar series called Straight Talk about owning a business. I personally started up my own companies uh, and know how it can be a challenge but it can also be very rewarding if you have the right plan and people in place. We're gonna be talking about both of those. Every uh, month for the next four months, you'll have the opportunity to listen in and participate, uh, uh, to participate uh, in this special webinar series, which will cover 10 different strategies and guidance to consider uh, in improving your small business. We hope you enjoy our real life stories, Hopefully we uh, entertain you in somewhat and make this interesting. The reason that we're doing this is we're trying to help you avoid the mistakes that others have made and you being able to achieve your success with a lot less friction. Both and I, both Mike and I have worked with business owners as Stacy has told you for many years. I started my career as a CPA, working with a large, working with a large business while working at Price Waterhouse in Manhattan and applied what I learned there to own my own tax practice, helping small business owners from startup to very large companies that ultimately went public. So I've had vast experiences to work with very small companies to very large companies and their growth and helping them get there in all aspects of that growth, not just in taxes. Whether you're in retail, manufacturing, service or technology, business industries, you have to decide what you want when you when you want your business to become, knowing that change will be inevitable as you grow. Changes may be needed for many reasons, such as demand, traffic, the economy, technology advances, and innovation by your competition. And let's not forget, recently, a global pandemic. Challenges can be overwhelming at times, as they have been for many small business owners recently. Being ready for change, however, means keeping your ears and eyes open as you monitor trends in the demands of the public or whoever your clientele is or, or customers and the changing needs of generations and their spending habits. Uh, younger 
operations right now are more focused on uh, experiences and putting off home purchases until their 30s in many cases. Uh, and many older uh, people that are in their uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and that's a relative term, older, are focused on also traveling. It's been pent up demand recently with everything that's gone on over the last six months. So we won't get into the economics of what's going on currently in our society and around the world, but we will help you talk to you about the things that can help you in your everyday business situation. Being creative and innovative will keep your company relevant and it is something that's a necessity. Otherwise, you can see that if you don't stay ahead of the curve, you could be swallowed up by it. Knowing how and when to leverage your time and talent is critical to your success. We would like to first, however, let Michael walk you through taking a short survey to help us gauge the audience that we're speaking to in terms of the types of businesses that you have and also the stage that you're in. Michael, I'll let you take this away and guide them through setting this up and taking a short, quick, simple survey. All right, John, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Nice to be with you. One of the unique things about being on a webinar like this versus being in person is my dog is next week. So I'm hoping he doesn't start to snore while I'm speaking. <laughs> but if everyone can see the screen, there are two ways to take this poll. You can either go to pollev.com slash big sun 494 or text big sun 494 to 22333 and the instructions are at the top of the screen those of you who are texting once you do that you'll get a dialog box don't click the link in the dialog box uh, i'll activate this now and once you are able to jump on either the website or the text just type in a letter uh, to let us know what type of business you are all in whether it's retail restaurants professional like business uh, accountant attorney etc technology manufacturing or other the purpose of us taking this poll is to try to customize the conversations and the direction that we can help you so that is tailored to the to the participants actually Take a few moments and we'll watch the results come in. You can also just, if the website or the texting doesn't work, you could just put it in the chat box if it's easier for you to. There you go, starting to roll in. We do appreciate your participation. Uh, we want to make sure that the stories align with the types of industries that you're in. And we have the second poll that will be taken shortly as well. That'll just tell us the stage of the business cycle that you're in. Okay. This is kind of what we thought, John. Yeah, we'll go to the next. And this is the same thing. I'll activate this. Yeah, this if is those of you. Yeah, this is very important to know whether people are in the startup phase, the first 10 years, which we call the growth phase, the next phase where you're starting to mature. And then the uh, last phase there, I, I think it is, is where 
you're ready to sell in the next five or 10 years or so. Depending on how many participants, the last two stages that we might recruit you for our firm to help us help our small business clients. <laughs> <laughs> That's a few thing or two. We learn we learn most of what we have here, not just from books, but for actually working with small business owners. So that's what's been most helpful. Okay. All right. Thank you all. John, I'll just go back to the presentation now. Yes. Michael, maybe um, you could start off here and give us some examples of some firms that you've worked with and what went right and what went wrong with their use of leverage of their time and talent? You know, I think we can uh, all name a couple, some of the big companies that, that are out there that are having troubles, right? Sears comes to mind, Radio Shack comes to mind, uh, to a certain extent, GE. Uh, and, and, you know, about 10 years ago, IBM was on the brink, uh, but then they rebuilt themselves once they realized that hardware was not the way to go, but software was, was the way to go. So those are big companies, but to bring it back to the context of tonight's discussion, you know, two stories come to mind. I had a client who was a bike shop owner in a fairly affluent town, and he had been there for quite some time. He actually bought the business from his father. And you know, with that, he owned the building where his bike shop was in. So about 10 years ago, someone else opened a bike shop in that town and came into the, my client's bike shop to introduce himself and very arrogantly say, I just want to introduce myself because I'm going to put you out of business. Uh, he did not realize that my client had owned his building and therefore did not need to pay rent, uh, where he just opened a store and had uh, to pay rent every month. So the differences in cash flow were drastically different. And le needless to say, that second bike shop is no longer there and my, my client's bike shop is still thriving. And then certainly something that's a little closer to home, I knew an advisor who was in our business uh, and this was in 2005. He was with a smaller company who was managed by someone who just did not recognize how important it was to de delegate and share responsibility. He just thought he could do everything on his own. And my friend didn't thrive well in that type of environment. And he sought another firm uh, and joined a firm that had a leader who was much more open to delegation, was much more open to sharing responsibility, was looking to, to start a collaborative environment. Fast forward to today, 2020, uh, the, the firm that my friend left is still about the same size it was, or just slightly bigger now, where that other firm is 10 times the size of that small firm. So the takeaway from there is what type of uh, management and leadership skill works better, uh, because one firm just has really taken off and the other one is just kind of muddling through. And a lot of people on the call have probably heard of the book E-Myth. Um, the takeaway from that book is it says if you are someone who is a good baker and you can uh, make a good batch of cookies or, or whip up a, a good batch of cupcakes, it doesn't necessarily translate well into you opening and managing and running a bakery well because of so many logistical issues with running a business. It's not just baking the cookies and the cupcakes, but it's managing the business. And when I shared this with John, John related back to a story of a former colleague of his that had a similar situation. So John, why don't you share that? Yeah, I, I had a uh, person that I work with and we were very close, very smart, uh, very intelligent, very good with uh, our clients and everything like that. And uh, when we first started out in the CPA world, um, he was very good at that and he's it did very well when we transitioned over to the wealth management business uh he focused primarily on doing the accounting for the firm when we needed him to focus on business development working on staff working on looking at technology and other areas in which he had some other talents which would quite frankly add a lot more value because i convinced him that you know we even though we can do this and we are cpas it wasn't the best and highest use of our time and talent. So we, we had those arguments, you know, from time to time and it took quite a while. And, uh, you know, I moved on is what happened. Uh, and I, I learned that, you know, leadership comes with it, new skills and uh, directing your time and talent to where it's gonna add the most value, value to the company 
to your clients and to your staff that you're working with. So that's one story. The other one is a story of my father, and um, he has passed uh, since uh, many years ago. But I remember growing up that he was, coincidentally, a baker, a long line, a long line of bakers. But he wanted to not be working at 12 o'clock at night until 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning anymore. And he decided to go the middle route and become uh, develop uh, bread routes. In that process, what I realized that my father is that he didn't want to have a large enterprise. And he uh, did not have the tolerance for a lot of employees. So he hired, let's call him Henry, to run one of his routes. And uh, then he wound up having two or three routes. But he always had to have transition of employees because he never got involved and hoped that it all worked out. Well, that transition led to having people that didn't have the best aptitude to working with the customers who, you know, you needed to, in a service business, you know, listen to and relate. And we'll talk about those downfalls. So the, the issues there are related to uh, making sure that you have the right people in the right place there and that you are ready to listen to people. So, uh, Mike, I think that you have told me time and time again some uh, great quotes, and I think you have one for us tonight. I do, John. There you go. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I will learn. And this is just underscoring the need to establish a work in a collaborative environment, right? The subtitle when John and I were looking at this webinar was um, stop putting out fires, right? So to the extent you can, you have to stop putting out fires. That means you can't wear uh, the same hat for, you can't be doing everything in your firm. It is very important to build a, uh, company culture and, uh, you know, something that's authentic and, and collaborative, as I've mentioned a couple of times. You know, when we look, when we look to hire uh, someone in our firm, we use a term called the canoe test. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, but basically if you're looking to hire someone, you know, it's, it's important to find someone with the right set of skills, but it's also important to hire someone who has a good attitude and someone someone you can work well with, right? You, can you spend a day in a canoe with this person? And it gives you a good indication of whether you can uh, work with them every day. Uh, and you're also looking to hire someone who's, who's not necessarily a reflection of yourself. You wanna hire someone who's a compliment to yourself. You certainly don't want a yes person. You don't want someone who's just gonna agree with everything. You want a little um, pushback and a little challenge and, and you want that person to, to help you grow your firm and grow it with them. Uh, I was uh, managing, or excuse me, uh, had a client who had a small firm, three people, excuse me, uh, three people in the firm, of course, the owner of the firm, the leader, and he hired two people. What he had done, which I thought was very smart, was make sure those two people cross train one another. Right. So for the obvious reasons, if someone is going on vacation, the other person can pick up that slack. But in the extreme situation, when one of those people were to leave the firm for one reason or the other, the other person can do that task, manage that task. So it doesn't, again, fall back on the manager or the owner of that company, because you don't want to be someone who's putting out fires and, and doing everything. It's also important to stay on task. You know, we've all been in a situation where you may be dealing with a client on the phone or, or have a client or a customer in the office and in your shop and something happens, maybe the copier jams. So there's an issue with the phone system. You don't wanna be that person uh, to have to deal with those. And uh, you know, at the risk of sounding a little condescending, those minor tasks, because you you need to stay on your task. If you're dealing with a client, you're dealing with a customer, you need to stay on task and do that. And the last thing we could say is, is and we'll talk more about this later in the series, but also later today is, is to tap into automation, especially today. Uh, for someone like us who's in the service business, LinkedIn has been a very valuable tool where you can network with other peers and also maybe potentially find clients. And if you have a retail shop, you're selling products, you need to be on Instagram, you need to be on Facebook, you need to leverage that technology because you see everyone is walking around with their phone in their hand. That is such a powerful tool. And if you could tap into that, 
um, you can do uh, use that technology to grow your business. So a lot of the things I just talked about here are leadership, right? There's a big difference between leading and managing. And I'm gonna pass it back to John now, and John is gonna go over the difference between uh, managers and leaders. Thank you, Michael. One of, one of the things you realize is that it's very easy to get distracted in business with all the things that uh, come at you. Uh, and if you don't learn how to delegate these things and trust other people and give them the opportunity to take on those responsibilities, you're not going to be able to lead. You're going to be managing all the time, which means that you're not going to be attentive to the future growth of that firm. So here on the screen, you'll see focus on leading, not managing. Find ways to di differentiate yourself. And we don't want you to die in the vine of success. So we're going to go over all those three quickly. Leaders are supposed to be the visionary people of the firm. And it doesn't mean they need to be the only one. We need you to get the other people that are involved in the firm to help you with that vision and make it become a reality. And a visionary weighs the risks and the opportunities while the managers focus on the career paths, the skill development or response to those they're guiding, regardless of what kind of business. You can't be the chief cook and bottle washer and see your firm grow because you're gonna wind up being that bottleneck that we talked about. And continue to find ways to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. A lot of times you'll find that small business owners, they get caught up on trying to be all things to all people. And if you're trying to be the low end provider, the high end provider, the high price provider, the low, low price provider in all aspects, you're going to find other competition are going to find their niche in one of those areas, and you're not going to be able to compete because you spread yourself too thin. So as you get into your business, continue to challenge what your end game is, where you're going, how you're going to have to keep up with the demands that the, that the public who you serve in either the products that you're delivering or the services that you are so that you can define your niche. Being more defined people will find you quicker in, in that area. When you go to the general practitioner, they're eventually gonna send you off if you have something that needs to be seen by that specialist. And when you get go to that specialist, you'll be known for that specialty and more and more people will seek you out. Don't die in a vine of success. You know, the fruit seems the sweetest at the end of the vine, but maybe before you start climbing the oak tree that you're building there, maybe you need to get some ladders pick the low-hanging fruit. Don't try to do too much too quick because you'll wind up getting yourself and all those that are working for you too stretched. And what I found out is when you put, push people too hard too long, they're either going to revolt or they're going to leave. And you want your organization to be collaborative so you don't want to burn out your team before your dream comes true. And in the meantime, what you're also trying to do is make sure that you're reducing all the friction. So those are the general advice about leadership. Be a person that inspires people. You are not there to do all their tasks. You don't want to do things that create redundancy between you and somebody else. Otherwise, one of you can be replaced. And usually that's the owner because they didn't stop to train people. So let's talk about building and attracting a uh, an elite team, your employees. Well. How do you find the right employees? A lot of small business owners say it's very hard to find the right employees. Well, first of all, you have to know where to look. But before you know where to look, you have to know what you need. So you need to know your company's mission and your values. What do you want your company to be portrayed at and seen and understood in the marketplace, even if it's small, that you want to attract? And based on what you're trying to accomplish, then you're gonna to need to seek out the employees as you grow, they're gonna fill those needs. And as Michael said earlier, they're not necessarily gonna be a complement of, uh, they're gonna be complementary to you, but not a clone of you. Because uh, otherwise you do everything well in business and you're gonna need them to fill those other voids that maybe you don't have the skill sets for. So that's very important. And that'll help you define what, who you're looking for. Next thing is make sure that under attracting uh, employees the best. Fair pay is very important. Be competitive and don't discriminate for the same job or work. 
employees talk. Make sure that they're not going to not come onto your job because you're not being competitive, not only in the pay, but in the work environment, the tools that you give them, uh, the environment to collaborate. Uh, all those things are very important. So I suggest you build an employee that uh, employee focused culture, which makes it fun to be at work. That doesn't mean everybody's hanging out at the cooler or the coffee stand. What it does mean is that people show each other respect. They could have a chance to collaborate when needed. And that even includes the very front desk person. I've said for many years that everybody is integral to the success of the businesses that I've been involved with from the first person they see or answer the phone on to what I believe maybe my talents are, are because of my skill sets as a wealth manager. It could be an attorney. It could be uh, the uh, head of a construction company. It doesn't matter what it is. Without the right people in the right places, you're only going to be as strongest as your weakest link. You've heard all these cliches, but they're no more important than the respect that you have to give each person and, and giving them the responsibilities and giving them the opportunity to take some risks. Involve employees in recruiting. Um, what you find out is that your employees can be more objective. And in many cases, the new employee that you're looking to hire is going to work a lot with the other employees that you already have. If they don't have a say in who is being hired, you may wind up hiring the wrong people for the wrong reasons. Let them partake in that. It also show the depth and strength of your organization, which if you've hired good employees before and trained them, they, it will be an attractive environment that people could thrive in and grow. So next thing is get it, you know, uh, and then involve people in that recruiting process. And I think, Michael, you had a story that you want to tell about that. I do. I do. And this this story to me is both funny and a little embarrassing, right? Uh, you know, John Elite mentioned earlier, you can learn by your mistakes. So this is probably about 10 or so years ago. And a little later on, I'll talk about you know, um, embracing your competition. So we have a, another firm that couldn't hire someone. They just didn't have the room to hire someone. And, and they knew we were looking. And they said, you should take a look at this person. She's smart, uh, great background. Everything works really, really well. It's just they didn't have room for her. So we had hired her. And within the first week, we were sitting and, and training her and walking through an Excel spreadsheet. And we were just asking her to, to add up a column of numbers in the Excel spreadsheet. And she reached over for her calculator and, and started adding the numbers up. And we asked her what she was doing. And she said, you wanted me to add the numbers. We said, you could do that in Excel. I mean, we learned very quickly she had never used Excel before. And that was all on us, right? That was not part of our vetting process. We took, uh, we, we took, um, we took a leap of faith there and it didn't work out. So needless to say, uh, after that, we included an Excel spreadsheet test as part of our hiring process. Go ahead, John. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, that's I have a similar story. It's on a little bit of a different topic, but I think that we all should always be on the lookout for our next hire. And the reason is, is that people move, people change careers, people change jobs, people health issues. People will go on maternity leave, whatever the situation is, that employee will leave your uh, employment. Um, when that happens, if you're not prepared to, ha to have an avenue to find people, whether it's through a recruiter, whether it's through the newspaper ads, whatever it may be, you have to be ready for that. But more importantly, keep your eyes and ears open. About 10 years ago, I'll tell you a short, quick story. Uh, I was going to take a uh, go go rent a car with a colleague of mine because we had to travel about four hours away and uh, we needed to rent a car. And when we went to the place uh, and showed up, there was a line kind of like going out the door about like 12 people. And we were like, oh, my God, we're never going to get out of here and we're going to be late for our appointment. Well, to our surprise, the person that was behind the counter and clearly running the office, you know, to take care of this was only two employees with all these people that they had to attend to, was amazingly able to keep people's frustrations uh, down. Uh, people were getting a little bit louder. 
She politely uh, respected them and listened, uh, let everybody know that she would get to them in a timely fashion. And before you know it, we were out the door in about 20 minutes. And I've been through this before. Uh, it was a local place. But most importantly, we were so impressed with her people skills that I turned to my co colleague and said, we need to hire this person. And the colleague said to me, where are we going to put her? I go, it doesn't matter. She has the right attitude and she's in a service business and she just gets it. And she's been with us to this point for the last 10 years and <laughs> it's been a rock in our organization and has grown tremendously because we gave her the time and energy to help her grow the things she needed and, you know, build her skill sets. But we could never hire a person that had that kind of attitude you know, even if we were looking for that person, which we were just very, very lucky. The next thing would be to connect online uh, that Michael was talking about here and attracting people. Uh, Michael talked about a little bit, I don't want to re repeat it, but get involved in your industry's uh, online uh, communications, whether it's a society, whether it's an organization uh, that represents a trade, whether it's in the professional setting like LinkedIn, Get out there, know who's looking, know what their skill sets are, put things out there, let people know that you're always looking for good talent, whether you hire them right now or even pass them on to another colleague in another company or something for one reason or another that you can't hire. Stay connected. The next thing is let's talk about retaining employees. It's one thing to hire them and hope that they work out by doing a good vetting job. So one of the things that we usually like to use is this is when you're trying to hire somebody and you're trying to train them, some things don't always work out. So be slow to hire and fast to fire. Uh, things that are not working out could destroy the culture of a firm. Being a leader or an owner of a firm that lets a bad tone permeate and continue on is not a good sign of leadership. It's letting the other uh, employees know at whatever kind of firm you are that you don't care about them as much. It doesn't mean that you don't give people a chance, but if you see that people are not adjusting or uh, responding to, you know, positive criticism in private, we always try to, you know, praise people in public and criticize or try to give improvement uh, things that people can do privately because we don't want people to be embarrassed. That, that's a terrible sign of leadership. The next thing is in retaining employees, try to make sure that you encourage creative thinking. A variety of people. Uh, variety keeps people engaged, invited. If you want people to take on responsibility, uh, you have to invite them to think. And, and they will make mistakes. You can set the parameters who can be minimizing any kind of cause. It can be just internal to a learning process or mentorship. But if you don't give the people to make, uh, give them the ability to make some decisions and make some mistakes and fail and learn from those things, you're going to be making all those decisions. They're not going to respect you because you're not going to give them the chance to engage. And if people are engaged, which through statistics and surveys that you read, 50% of most people in small businesses are not engaged because their boss doesn't give them the opportunity to take on any responsibility. And then they're never going to grow with you. And you wonder why you stay late at night. So give them the opportunity and don't be the bottleneck. Put money into supporting and training employees. It is critical that people have those resources. Otherwise, they're not going to grow and they're going to stagnate. Mike, I think you have a story on this one as well that we both yeah. uh, experienced. That's right. So we have a budget for continuing education credits at Modera. And we all need the CE credits to maintain our designations, but it's also important not only the content that you're getting at these presentations, but the networking, the sharing of best practices. You may even find uh, future employees at one of these seminars. So it's, it's something that we encourage and support. Yeah, that goes for the same with almost any industry. Uh, I, I know that, like, for example, I have some friends that have car dealerships uh, and they have a service, you know, area. Uh, like we all go to, I guess, and uh, they're sending people out to this continuing education that they, they can keep up with the advancements and the technology and computers and things like that. 
so these people can handle things when you come in. We've got to do the same thing in our industry, and the same thing's going to happen in almost any industry where people could improve their skill sets. So encourage it, come up with the things that you can afford, and ask them for advice on how they can do it and how it will pay them back in their skill sets and being more uh, of an asset to your, uh, to your organization, as well as to their own resume. Not to get them to leave, but let them know that you're investing in them. That's very important. Another thing is on retaining employees. We have to start letting go in many cases as we've been through this and we can see this of the nine to five mentality. Uh, that's keeping people what I call in the employee mentality that says it's not my it's not my responsibility. Give people the responsibility and the control to manage their day. It doesn't mean that you can't communicate all, uh, and focus on what's most important and when the clients expect you to be there. Uh, so it could simply be that you're flexible in letting people control the days and coordinate with their other employees to cover their backs when they need to leave for an hour or two if it's for a kid or something happens in their family or to go to that ball game one time and leave it a little bit early. I, I can tell you time and time again in many companies, not just ours, that it is so appreciative. And when you need them, they will stay late. And I'll make you I'll make you another suggestion. If somebody stays late for you or comes in early or goes the extra mile and does something extra for you, you may want to reward them by rewarding them uh, by rewarding their spouse or their significant other in many cases, or or giving them a gift card. Or, or to go have a dinner out and, and show your appreciation for the extra things that they've done for you. It, it, it's huge. Give pats on the back uh, when you see some, somebody's done something extra. Recognition and feedback is critical to the environment and the culture of, of your business. For, surveys have shown that the smallest compliments, and this is just intuitive, give the biggest rewards. They know that while you're growing your company, you may not be able to give huge bonuses or extra you know, big things right now. But the fact that you're acknowledging them is a sign of pr that they take pride in the work that you've seen it. And it's also a sign of flattery that, you know, you, you've identified that and you're not discounting it and that it's not just expected to do your job because you will see the distinguishment in employees and those that are getting that recognition, it will be contagious that other people are gonna wanna have that same recognition. And then the last one here that just in general here is that encourage a environment of uh, meritocracy. And what that means, it sounds like a fancy word, but really what it means is that you reward the people that go the extra mile and don't do their job. It doesn't mean that you discourage or you don't give credit to the people who do their job that's expected, but let people know what your expectations are. Let them know that you have high expectations. Let them know that you, you know, encourage them to give you, them your opinions of how to improve things. You will have employees that will stick with you for many, many years. We have a very low in, uh, employment uh, turnover in our firm. And one of the main reasons that we learned over time is the getting feedback from them on what's important to them. And even though pay is a starting point, it's not the critical things that keep people employed with you. And manage your managers, the last thing here. Be a leader, not a dictator. Focus on teamwork. Know, a per know that no person is an island. Be a, a person that guides people, doesn't tell them what to do, because people like the idea that they take on responsibility, and it is the main reason that they can grow, because they're going to learn from some of their mistakes and be a mentor, and then you're going to have to hire other people that will do the same thing. Um, Mike, can you talk about ways to attract now? Now we're going to move on to your clients and your customers that you have. When we first start out in businesses, many times we take what we can get. But if you're really thinking about the long term and what your business is going to look like, you have to think about and maybe call your client base as much as you can at the beginning or at least begin to start doing it again because your customers will make you aware of the clients that take up 80% of your time but only bring you 20% of your revenue. Mike, you want to talk about how to attract and retain uh, the best clients and customers? 
Sure. But before I do that, I want to recognize a comment that we got in the chat box. And it was something that I had mentioned before about um, the learning budget. And, and Joseph said, don't make your learning budget a way of rewarding your friends and supporters, which is a good point. I agree yes. with that too. And uh, we could also pause here to see if there's any other questions. P feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, but thank you, Joseph. That's an excellent comment. We appreciate that. Yes. All right. So thanks, John, for the lead in. Uh, you know, John did talk about building an elite team, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, attracting and, and getting a good client and customer base. And there is a bit of a correlation between the two, right? We're, we talked about um, collaboration with finding employees and building a culture of collaboration. You kind of want that with your clients or your customers too. You want to be working with people that you form a team together. There, to me, there's a distinguishment between um, someone who you work with who is challenging you and someone who you work with who is questioning you. I appreciate working with a customer or a client who challenges me. I certainly don't want people to say, Mike, whatever you say, I think that, you know, let's move on with that. I'd rather people say, why are you recommending that? Or why are you taking that direction? Uh, that to me forms a good relationship, a good long-term relationship. And I, I want someone challenging to me as someone who understands what we're doing. We're questioning is someone who doesn't have that trust factor yet, doesn't really trust what we're doing, they're questioning it versus, versus challenging us. Uh, and a little bit of a correlation with the canoe test uh, from earlier too, you certainly want to clients and customers that you have a good relationship with and you do get along with, but that's not as necessary as, as finding the employee to fit that bill. We all have customers and clients that you don't have a great relationship with, but they appreciate what you do. You certainly want that. Um, the big difference with the canoe test is you're not spending that much time with them. You do have to have the meeting and, and it's, it may be an uncomfortable meeting, but in the end, they appreciate what you do. And you know, the, the graphic that um, our colleague Joy put together on this slide here, I, I saw this at, at, at a presentation before, and it, it is interesting that the word, the letters that make up silent and listen are the same, right? Because it is very important for us to listen to our clients. You certainly don't want to be the person who's doing all the talking. Uh, it's all about communications. You need to ask more and assume less and just have a, a good dialogue going. And it just leads us into this overall theme here of communication. Uh, it's important to set realistic expectations, right? You, we've all heard the term uh, under promise and over deliver, whether it's a report or whether it's a product, you know, if you can, you don't want to say I can get this to you tomorrow and then it takes a week to get there, or you really want to go the other way and say, you know, I think we can get this to you in, in two weeks. Then if you come up with it in a week, that looks much better than the other way around. Uh, so it's very important to set those realistic expectations. Um, you think about if you go into a barber, suppose you had to describe to the barber every time you walked in what, you're, what, you, what you want your haircut to be like. It, it's, it's important. Um, in, in terms of the next three bullet points, I talked a little bit about um, leveraging technology. So for us, we use a client relationship manager or CRM. That's just what we use for someone who's in the service business. If you're in manufacturing, maybe it's something that you can track your vendors, the communications, the orders that you've had with your vendors or your suppliers, but we need to take advantage of this technology. I'm a big note taker, right? So it's important for us to take notes and then follow through and refer back often, right? There, you can take notes and then never refer to them again. So why even bother? Why even bother taking the notes? Think of how important it is if you're entering into a long-term relationship and, and before you go into a meeting, you refer back to those notes and say, you know, remember when we first met, this is what you asked for. Is that still in place or has that changed? Uh, clients, customers appreciate the fact that you remember going back that, that far. It's also important to do what you say you're going to do. Again, at the outset of a meeting, you may promise someone X, you better deliver on X. 
for us, it's I will call you at least quarterly. Um, if there's volatility in the markets, we're going to reach out to see if there's questions. We're going to let you know what we're doing. If you get someone on your team as a client or a customer, and you've promised them certain things, you want to be able to, to deliver and say what you're going to say. And before we talked about ask more and assume less, it's important to ask open-ended questions. You don't want to be in a situation where you're asking clients questions and the answer is yes or no. You're not going to learn a lot with a yes or no answer. You need to ask these open-ended questions. And John, I think you have an example here. Yeah, well, so, some of the things that I want to reiterate that you just said there, you know, is expectations. And uh, when you first meet with somebody, you know, first impressions mean the most. You may not get a second opportunity. So setting expectations at the beginning, listening to people, Mike's point about going back to notes, what's really appreciated by anybody. It, it would be like going into a doctor. You had a physical. And then the next time you come in, they don't look back at your notes and they give you the wrong prescription because you're allergic to something. <laughs> that would be a disaster for many for, at many levels. Well, in any kind of business, uh, whether it's your car, think about coming in with a car and the service writer at the front desk, uh, you know, listens to uh, the man or the woman that goes there. And they don't go back and using Mike's, you know, thoughts here, go back and communicate that to the mechanic or share the paper or they have, or they're illegible and they don't see it. And they say, it's making a clanking noise on top of needing, I think, new tires and this and that. And then they call back and say, it's time to pick up your car, come and pick it up. And then when you come pick it up, they sold you the tires. They didn't check your headlight. They didn't look into the clanking noise and you're leaving it on and go, I thought you said everything was, was fixed. Oh, Frankie or Joe or Barbara or whatever uh, didn't do that. I'm sorry about that. And I'm going, why? I, I, it took me, I had to schedule this time to take off from work or whatever the case may be. It could be very, very frustrating. So listening is a sign of attentiveness and it's a sign of respect that you're, you're being, uh, that they were being heard. And that is critical to customers. I don't care what business that you're in. Make sure that the handoffs, where most of the things fall off from the person, so to speak, taking the order, that it gets delivered and is clear. So like in our business, for example, or in any business, we make sure that we're communicating those things well. And to Mike's uh, comments earlier, it doesn't matter what business you're in, take good notes, whether it's on a computer, handwritten, whatever. Uh, Mike and I may be a little bit old school as much as we're using a computer every day. We may be, you know, still stuck to rock and chisel and taking some notes down sometimes because you don't want to be right typing on a screen when you're talking to somebody across from them. So those things right. are very, very important. And, uh, and, and the other thing is, is when you're listening and you, the best thing for us and in any service business or any kind of business for that matter is is asking those open-ended questions so that you can get people to do most of the talking because you're trying to find out in the first place what they need and what they want. They may think they know what they need, but it could be something different after you've heard them explain their circumstances. Then you can come back to them in a consultative manner. I don't care if you're the bicycle shop guy, the mechanic, whoever it is, or in our type of business and professional. So you can say, from what I've heard, this is what I understand. Please tell me if I've heard everything correctly. And then you would want to ask them, say, can I ask a few more questions to make sure that I, underco that I uncover all the details so that when we go and look or look at your materials, look at your car, look at whatever, if you're in a service business, what you're looking for or if i go in the back to find you shoes what kind of shoes do you like what kind of style if i don't find your size it doesn't matter what the business is be respectful and give them an opportunity to tell you their story and what they're looking for their needs thanks john and just a bit of irony here taking notes and i'm looking at my own notes as you can tell that I, my barber example should have been used under the second bullet point not the first one so notes don't always work but moving on, uh, the last one is appreciate and understand your competition. You know, I mentioned before we have a good rapport with a number of other advisors throughout the country. 
Um, and there are competition, but we certainly appreciate we, what they do. We learn some best practices from them. We learn what works, what doesn't work. Um, and it's also important not to bash your competition. We are going through a process right now where I'm, I live in a condo and we need to replace the roof. We've met with a number of roofers and the last guy we met with just bashed the competition. He just told us everything that was wrong with the first three quotes that we got. And that just didn't sit well with everyone. So it's it's never good to bash your competition. I, and I try not to make comparisons using negative references. So it's important to understand and appreciate your competition and recognize that you're not alone out there. You're all trying to vie for the same business. And you know, you'll learn from each other and, and embrace that and don't uh, don't don't look at it as, as much of a challenge as it is. Yeah, Michael, on that last that last point, there's nothing wrong with people saying, here are the differences between the quotes you got. I think it all comes down to the tone. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you don't yeah. mind people because, quite frankly, the person can be helpful. I want, you know, we do that in our own business, quite frankly, we'll say, well, there are differences in what you've seen before and what you've heard. Let us help you understand the pros and cons of each, and then you can make an intelligent decision. And the people appreciate that because you're trying to guide them. That That's the same thing we talked about before about employees as well it is, is about customers you know, and clients. They, they want to be heard. They want to be listened to. They want to be able to feel that they were part of the process of making a decision and not being sold. Yep, agreed. And that is it. So again, we will pause here. And uh, Stacy, I don't know if, if we open it up for questions or if people just use the chat. Um, either way is good for us. People were and using the Q and A, but I I don't see anything coming in at the moment. I think you answered everything already. Okay. Well, let, let me let me put. I don't know if we answered anything. Maybe we've confused people. <laughs> Maybe overwhelmed them. Maybe we didn't give them enough details. I'm not sure. But I can tell you this, this session was a starting point on the foundational issues for starting or transitioning a business or rethinking about some of the things in your current practices. We're going to get into more technical issues uh, that were more uh, detail oriented and substantive as we go forward. On the screen right now, we're going to be coming back on the next session. And by the way, just as a Get these things on your calendars and, and, and try to come to all the sessions if you can, but they will be held on the uh, the first Thursday of every month, same exact time, you know, same bat channel here. I'm dating myself here. Every <laughs> month uh, on the first Thursday of every month, Stacy will probably send you out a reminder of those specific dates, uh, and we're trying to do that to be consistent. Uh, the next one is a very critical one with the end of the year coming with a lot of opportunities here to talk to you about taxes uh, and talking about retirement plans and talking about budgeting uh, and working with your accountant or CPA uh, and, and other professionals. Uh, uh, please don't miss the next one as well. Uh, we're going to have other speakers here. Uh, Mike took the time and talent to get with me to kind of go over these issues, which we've collaborated on before, but you'll have three other new speakers as well. I'll be coming in and, and helping in each of these sessions uh, as the alumnus, and I have experience in all of these areas working with as a CPA for so many years, and I, I hope you find this a little bit lighthearted, but at the same time, giving you some tangible things that you can take away. So take a look at what's on the screen. Stacey will follow up with these things and give you those, uh, uh, the time to also call us as we progress here if you have questions and we will have free opportunities here for you to give us a call. No obligation uh, to go over this. This is a outreach program to uh, our alumnus here and working with Stacy and uh, corporate development here, working with uh, business owners. Both Michael and I work up and down the East Coast and actually going west, out west. I have clients out uh, where I can go ski sometimes. But for the most part, <laughs> we're primarily on the East Coast right now where our offices are. We have offices from Boston to Florida, and we work with people in in our state and out of our state. Uh, and I'm sure that somebody could uh, give you answer some of your questions if you have them. Feel very comfortable calling out. We've had a number of uh, alumni call me over the years as I've given many different presentations and found out that uh, they've gotten a lot of good answers and gave them guidance, whether they work with their own individual advisors or even us, it doesn't matter. Thank you for the time to be able to do this. 
And uh, we look forward to the next session in a month from now. And I'll point out the link at the bottom of the page, John, for the free resource. If someone wants to get the key financial planning questions for small business owners, there's a link at the bottom of that page to go to our well, website to download that. That's right. Th these are all free uh, resources for you. Great. I do see one question that just came in. If you have a moment to answer it. Of course. Um, Rita says, this is great. Will number nine dive into how differently businesses can find creative ways uh, technically or otherwise connect with clients during the pandemic? Yes, we are trying to customize this to, uh, let's just call it foundational issues as well as current events. So like in the next session, we're going to be talking about things that are going on in the tax world. We will also talk about how to outreach uh, to people in this pandemic. None of us know when, you know, the vaccine is going to come and when we're going to get back to normal. I don't even know what a new normal is going to look like, but we're going to tell you what we've seen with the business owners that we've worked with through their trials and error on what has worked. Keep in mind, you know, we're, we're not the Wizard of Oz here. We don't have all the answers behind the curtain. What we do, knew, do know is, and what we do do, Michael and I and all of our colleagues, we have over 30 advisors serving our client base, we collaborate together and have internal chat meetings and blogs and committee meetings about all of these planning issues that relate to people's individual finances as well as how they're integrated with their small business because that's a lot of their wealth. And these topics come up all the time. Just three months ago, I collaborated with uh, four other people in, my, in our firm and we put out pieces all about the PPP loans that came out, which was a very specific topic. And we worked a whole weekend to try to understand it. And as it winds up, they made about 20 different iterations of changes and updates that were very hard to keep up with, but that's what we do. Because we are working with the CPAs, we're working with the estate plan attorneys, we're working with the insurance people, and this is all for individuals and people who own businesses. So yes, we will uh, try to stay relevant and topic on these things as they're uh, changing and up to date in our in our communities and in our country. Yeah, and if I'll add, that's a great question, Rita, thanks. Uh, you know, finding silver linings in the cloud, right? Something right. like this that we're doing tonight uh, is something you can do easy, easily, I should say. We've had uh, colleagues in our offices run webinars like this that are on specific to topics and we bring in uh, that topic expert. I'm actually running one in October for estate planning, and I have an estate planning attorney. One of our colleagues ran one of these on property and casualty insurance and had a property and casualty insurance specialist on there. You know, it takes half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, one evening just to do this. There's no traveling, there's no uh, traffic, there's no issues. Uh, you could just sit and learn in, in a comfortable environment. So it's something like that. What we're doing right now works really easily and the technology makes it a snap to do. Yeah, and we and we embrace it because we have to keep up. Great, thank you. So I just wanna say a quick thank you for everyone for joining us today and a special thank you to John and Michael for sharing their knowledge. For their full bios, please go to stjohns.edu backslash CF webinars. Here you will also find a schedule of upcoming webinars and past recordings. And just to reiterate what John said, our special edition webinar series for four small business owners will be held the first Thursday of every month at 6 p.m. We hope to see you next month on October 1st, where we will discuss year-end tax planning. In the meantime, have a great night. Thank you. Enjoy Labor Day weekend, everyone. Be safe. Be safe. Take care. Take care. Thank well, you. Thank you, Stacey. Take care, guys.